everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to Crowdsurfing. This is a video in which we talk about um, Kickstarter, basically, and all the different projects on Kickstarter. This is always an interesting time of year because uh, Essen is now over. We're at Christmas time, and so a lot of people aren't as interested technically now with Kickstarting stuff because they're not going to get it in time for Christmas. So you, you Kickstart and they say, delivery in November and December, and you're like, what? That's amazing. I'm going to get it for Christmas. It's my Christmas gift. Of course, it's delayed. You get it January, February. But still, that's an interesting thing. So I think that we're going to see a bit fewer projects right now, but there's still some interesting stuff. In fact, let's get started. All right, let's take a look at some Kickstarter projects, which I found interesting. We'll start with Ironclad, a story-driven space opera cooperative board game. That's a mouthful. It's a kind of interesting as a lot of these uh, Kickstarters have these really long subtitles, but I think it's quick. It's like, before you leave, this is what the game is. Anyhow, this is their first one. Really great artwork. I really like how this game looks. They talk about how it's a video game. You're all on a spaceship working together. It's the Ironclad is the name of the ship, and it's a mercenary ship, and you're just going through adventures. That sounds very similar to Battle Stations from Guerrilla Games, um, but this one looks a lot cleaner, a lot faster, so I hope it's really good. Monster Slaughter. This one I was really close to picking as my pick of the week. I really like how this one looks. You are monsters in this game, going outside a cabin and going in and slaughtering the annoying teenagers inside. You might be a group of golems or zombies or aliens or whatever you are. The artwork is silly-ish. It's not overly silly, um, but it's also not super gory and nasty either. And so it has this, you know, but they have all these things like you don't know about these teens. You're going in, you're searching. They might be hiding somewhere. And again... I know that sounds like dreadful, but I think it's done with enough camp that it looks interesting. And the artwork looks really fun. Uh, the Great War, the French army. This is a um, this is from Richard Borg's The Great War, which is his Commands and Colors World War I uh, universe. Uh, this is the French army. It adds 14 different special figures. They're also doing a special cent centenary edition for the uh, 100th anniversary of World War I. So that's interesting. Uh, this will be a lot of uh, fun for people who like that set. Then there's Galactic Warlords. This is the second time that this Kickstarter has launched. This one is doing well. It's a, galact it's a card drafting area control style game. So at first glance, when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, this looks like a 4X game and you're exploring and blowing other people up. But it looks more like area control, a few plastic pieces. The whole production of this one looks excellent. So I'm hoping it's a good game. Another... Um, this is, I think, their first Kickstarter. This is the second time they've run it, but this time it's going to fund. Monster Dice Box 2. Okay, I like dice, so I always like accessories. This is a dice box uh, that looks like a gelatinous cube. I really like how it looks. It's clear. You put your dice in, so this dice box has swallowed your things. They've done one before. The same company. It looks like a mimic. Um, the, the thing has a treasure chest, and then it opens up and eats people. I like this one better, and they said that this is a prototype that will get even better as it goes on, so let's hope so. Bellwether Game has made several Kickstarters, um, Cold Water Crown, etc. They have one now for um, Mars Open Tabletop Golf. Now, this one intrigues me because, first of all, I like the theme. It's a tabletop golf on Mars. That's pretty cool. But secondly, it's an actual dexterity game where you're going to make different holes and golf course holes like a miniature golf and then flicking something into them. That's a cool concept, and I hope they really pull it off in this game. Then we have a game called Medieval. This is the first game from HGN. I'm mind boggled. This thing has 59,000 at the time of me recording this. The box cover doesn't look interesting. It's called Medieval. Uh, and yet in this game, the theme is interesting because you're these shadowy cabals that are behind the scenes in medieval Europe. The, the uh, Mongols are rampaging through in disease, and you're, but you're trying to control stuff behind the scenes. That sounds really cool. The game doesn't really strike me as like, wow, how this looks. But again, again, I'm kind of drawn to the fact that a lot of people are interested in this, so we'll have to wait and see. Board Game Bowls. Well, I actually have a couple of these here with me. Uh, they sent these to me. These are bowls with different uh, kind of logos and stuff in them to hold your components on the table. They're really nice. I like the whole wooden bowl thing. Like these would be good for to replace the bowls maybe in um, Century Spice Road or just any game. And they have all different sizes and things. They're a little pricey. Um, but they're also really nice quality. These are the kind of things I can see you having in your game thing. You play a game, you bring these out. Just very classy. This is my pick of the week. I really do enjoy these a lot. And 
Again, it's it's more of an elite type of uh, luxury item, but I like them. Then we have Museum Rush from uh, Room 17 Games. Great trailer for this one. They did a good job putting it together with the music and everything. This is, I think, the third Museum Heist game I've seen this year, but this one does look good. Has miniatures and stuff you're trying to get in and steal and get out. Um, it's competitive rather than cooperative, so I find that interesting. Um, so I hope it does well. I like this theme. The last one I played of this game was good, but it was, you know, the theme was just barely there. This one I hope is excellent. NSKN has Mistfall Chronicles of Frost. Now, this is not actually Mistfall the game. This is a sequel to it. They actually showed me a little bit of this one at Essen. And in this one, you're going to be making your character out of cards and then using and kind of uh, putting tokens on these cards and go through. It's a much lighter game. We're talking a 60-minute style game where you have to think tactically to be able to, to go through an, a dungeon. I really like the concept. I hope the game is great. Watzel Palag is making... A Chidna Shuffle. Um, is it a Chidna Shuffle? I'm not sure. It's these really cute little Australian animals, it looks like. Uh, and it's a pickup and delivery game, but it's for kids. They, I mean, they're, they're big plastic pieces. And this is not new to Watson Plague. They made, they made a beer game one time with these different beer bottles that looked like they were kids' uh, toys, although I wouldn't recommend giving your kid a pile of little beer bottles. Um, but so this has that thing, and this one is geared towards families, so I, I'm looking forward to that one. Soaring Rhino is a new company from Craig and Jeff Van Ness. They're brothers. Craig Van Ness is claimed to fame as he's the other half of the design team with Rob Davio, who's very popular. They did uh, Star Wars Queen's Gambit and Heroescape and things like that. So he has a game called Shifting Realms here, which actually is about colliding realms. I don't know why I don't know just call it colliding realms, but you have these three realms. You pick three realms, and then you're doing things. It looks like a real-time strategy style game where you're collecting resources and trying to accomplish the goal of whatever three realms that you put together. The concept's good. Craig has done some great stuff. This is the second time they ran a Kickstarter. The first time they ran it did not succeed, but it also the Kickstarter does look really bad. This new one looks a lot better, so I hope that people realize Craig does a really great job designing games and back this one. From Strangely Games, we have Full Moon Jacket. Full Moon Jacket takes place in the 1969 in the Vietnam War with werewolves. <laughs> it looks like a tactical, it's a cooperative squad level game with arcade mode, survival mode, nightmare mode. It actually gives me um, kind of a flashback to just different older games. We had the, you know, some miniatures and you're moving from point to point. It doesn't look that complex at all, but looks like it's, you know, campy, silly fun. I hope it is. And finally, the last one for today is Hero Tech, customized super gear for tomorrow's superheroes, a two-player game in which you are making stuff for superheroes to use. And so you're trying to get them to buy it and get them to come to you. It's a great theme. Superheroes is a big, you know, big thing these days. Being the person who gives them the capes and the things they need, I like that idea. All right, that's what I found interesting. Let's keep moving. Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here back with more Kickstarter lineup. That's right, I'm bringing you projects that won't break the budget, but throw in a little something extra. This week I've been checking out a new game from a new designer, Jason Bice from B-Team Games. Let's take a look. It's called Loot the Body. It's on Kickstarter right now. In the game, players are competitors diving into a dungeon to defeat the bad guys and get as much treasure as they can. The game is card-based and comes with some fun art that is very reminiscent of an old coin-operated video game we used to play called Dragon's Lair. The art lets you know right away, hey, this is not a serious design, a dungeon crawl. Instead, it's going to be a fun little take that kind of a filler. Players start with similar hands of colored cards representing the amount of damage that they could do to monsters that they encounter in the dungeon. If you are lucky enough to dispatch the baddies, then the ones who damage the creature gets a share of the loot. Of course, it's not that easy. There's always complications. First off, playing the cards has a speed challenge to it. You definitely don't want to be the last player to take your card, to play your card, or you may have to take extra powerful damage. But you can earn special action cards that mess with the rules of the game, like maybe switching around cards or after players have already played their attack cards. And you always have to be ready for those traps and treasure that come your way. Let's take a quick look at the pledge levels. For 25 bucks, it's a base pledge that, you, that gets you the main dungeon deck, the monster and the boss monster cards, the treasures and traps, 
and the unique character cards and power cards for use in clearing out the dungeon. You also get some coins. You'll get the uh, dice that represent the speed aspect of the game. Plus, there's a little bit of lanyard. As exclusive, the project's going to come with additional character cards that won't be in the retail version. Hey, do you want to play a Dragonborn in the game? You can with these limited cards. Now, we played an earlier version of the game, and we liked the dungeon exploring. We had some problems with some of the mechanisms, but it looks like they've cleared those up, and they've streamlined the game since then. I like what they've done so far. To recap, for $25, bucks, you are going to get a brand new filler-type card game with some fun art, take that mechanics, and streamline gameplay. And yep, some nice lanyap with the extra character cards. So let's loot the body out on Kickstarter right now from Jason Vice and his company, B-Team Games. What do you think of this game? Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, les ailes, bon temps roulé. Hey folks, I'm Mark Street from Board Game Corner and welcome to another Dice Tower Preview Recap. Recently, Randy and I took a look at a couple new games on Kickstarter. First up, Dawn of Peacemakers is a game about bringing peace to two warring nations for one to four players. In Dawn of Peacemakers, you are an adventurer and peacemaker trying to bring these two warring factions to a peaceful conclusion and end the war. You and your fellow adventurers will work together to lower the motivations of both the Scarlet Macaws and the Ocelots and bring balance back to the realm in the hopes of negotiating a truce. Donna Peacemakers is brought to you by Snowdale Design. Next up, Samurai Vassal is a fast-paced simultaneous action card game for two to six players. Each player takes on the role of a samurai to propose policies to the daimyo in order to win his trust. You can form alliances with other players and strategize your moves, or deceive your allies to win more trust points. The first player who gains 12 trust points from the daimyo wins. Samurai Vassal is brought to you by Ice Mix. For more details on each of these games mentioned, please check out our full previews and see if these games might be of interest to you. And if you are interested in having your game featured as a Dice Tower preview, please reach out to Tom or myself and keep an eye out for more previews in the near future. All right, folks, until next time, we'll see you at the table. So Kickstarter has started over a decade ago now, and it's amazing to see how much Kickstarter has changed the landscape of board gaming. It definitely has had a lot to go on. Uh, different publishers have come in and started Kickstarter, and then they continue on. And it's intriguing to me, the question that comes up very often is, should established publishers use Kickstarter? And everyone has a different answer for that. Some people say, um, well, everyone, the Kickstarter is a level playing field. Anyone can use it. Other people say, why are they using it? They're taking away notice from the small independent people. And then there's people, I remember one time talking to the president of Tasty Minstrel about this because they started essentially with Kickstarter and now they're a fairly established company. And he said, if you start with Kickstarter then you and you become an established company, then it's okay to keep using Kickstarter. So it's okay for them to do it and like Simon to do it. That seems like odd reasoning to me, but um, either way, this is a, a fight that's gonna go on for a long time about this. I think it doesn't matter in the long run. Let me rephrase that. Even if I really cared about it, which I really don't, but let's say I really did care about it, what is me caring about it going to do? You can't stop them. Kickstarter's not going to go, hmm, we would like to take millions of less dollars a year, please. No, they're, they want the money, right? So Kickstarter's going to take that money. So it's not going to change. The big companies aren't going to go, hmm. In fact, most big companies don't do it so much as to make money, but they do it because of the reach it has, its own marketing thing. And a lot of companies are using it. A lot of companies said that they wouldn't use it and then use it anyway. Or companies find ways to use it as, a, as on the side. I don't think we'll ever see the day where everyone will use it. And there's a lot of reasons to not use it. We saw one of the biggest Kickstarter brands, Stonemaier Games. We saw Jamie move away from that and stop using Kickstarter. But, I mean, I don't think everyone's ever going to use it. But is it wrong for the bigger companies to do so? I, I, don't, I don't really think that there is anything wrong with it. Because we would then have to put some sort of line in the sand. And how do we know where that line is? You know, like, if you have more than five games... If your net worth is over a million dollars, if you, you're only allowed to do four or five Kickstarter brands. And this has always bugged me, this whole indie is better. 
Just because you're a small little company doesn't mean that you deserve more looks than everyone else. You gotta earn what you get. And sure, I, I can understand, you know, going out of your way maybe to as a media company and you promote smaller publishers and that's fine, but to like have disdain for someone because they're bigger, why would they not do it? The only way for us to make any sort of noticeable change here is to not back the projects by these big established companies. You know, a lot of people say, okay, we're going to boycott them. But first of all, I don't think that's a worthwhile use of our time. But secondly, I don't think it could happen, right? You say, oh, I don't, let's all boycott this big company. And then they say, but listen, there's stretch goals, some a lot of great miniatures. And we're like, ah, la, la, la. I want all that stuff. So this is an argument that pops up all the time. Established companies shouldn't be using Kickstarter. But I think it's a worthless argument. And what I mean by that is, whether you have merit on, on saying it or not, I think it's kind of like saying, I wish the sky wasn't blue. You really can't change it. We can't really change a thing. You yourself can make a, a, you know, a determination that you will only back people who you think are small and deserving of it, and that's fine. But you're not going to see the big guys change their mind on this. And I think you'll see more and more of them enter Kickstarter, but you'll also see more of them leave Kickstarter too, because there's a lot of benefits to not being on Kickstarter. We'll talk about that in the future. Benefits of not Kickstarting your game? Anyhow, we'll keep going here. This is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about accounting. I want to preface this by saying that I am not an accountant. Um, I hire an accountant to do Stonemeyer Games' taxes, and even my own personal taxes at this point. And, um, but I have talked with accountants a number of times about accounting as related to Kickstarter projects. Also, I'm a US-based creator and entrepreneur, so these rules are going to be different in different places around the world. Um, accounting is something that you really do want to think about now, well before you launch your project. Uh, for one specific reason, and then I'll mention a few things to think about after your project is over. The thing to think about now is uh, I highly recommend opening a checking account and a PayPal account that are specifically and only for your business. It's really important to separate your business expenses from your personal expenses, both for legal reasons, accounting reasons, and just for ease of use so you can keep those funds separate. Um, it's something that I waited to do until a few months after I funded uh, my, my Viticulture Kickstarter campaign, the first one, and, uh, and I regretted it. I wish I had separated them right away because it made things a lot easier once I did that. So I recommend doing that right now, like as after you watch this video. Um, the three things to think about after your project funds, one, uh, you have to pay income taxes on all uh, earnings from your Kickstarter project. Um, so all those funds, th those are those will be taxed. Um, they'll be taxed specifically based on your profit in the year that you deliver the games. So say I funded a project in 2015, um, I raised $100,000 in 2015. Uh, I also spent, say, $40,000 in 2015, maybe starting the manufacturing, some of the art, a lot of that stuff. And then we shipped the game in 2016. And uh, at that point, I paid some other manufacturing costs. I paid all the, the shipping costs. Maybe they added up to $80,000. I'm left with a profit of $20,000. I pay taxes on all of that. All of that's pushed together and to determine that $20,000 uh, profit margin. That is determined in 2016, when I actually shipped the game. Um, so think about that as you are preparing your project. And really, it's almost a way to relax a little bit. Sometimes creators worry about trying to spend as much money as possible in, in the year that they funded, or they're, they're worried about paying a huge amount of taxes that year and not having the money. But you don't have to worry about it. You, you pay taxes using the accrual method the year that you actually ship the product. Also, if you're in the US, you have to pay sales tax uh, for in-state backers. So you have to calculate that as well. There are many other uh, accounting considerations. I highly recommend that you meet with an accountant well in advance of running your project. If you go to my website and look under uh, accounting, you can see that there's a, an accountant that I use in St. Louis who knows Kickstarter really well because of all the stuff that I've had him do. So you can talk to Justin and, and get a good uh, feel of what you need to do um, and just have him do your taxes as easy as that way. Um, but yeah, good luck with your taxes and go open that checking account and that PayPal account that's just for your business. Thanks. 
Oh, hey, what's funding? Just uh, enough time to take a very quick look at a game that's seeking funding right now. And today we're taking a look at Root. So here we're taking a look at Root, a game of woodland might and right. Now, this is an asymmetric game where players will either be the Maquis de Cat faction who are trying to invade the forest, build buildings, craft items, and destroy the old buildings. You could play as the old Eerie Order, who are trying to retake their birthright, and they're going to gain victory points by the roost that they have, and they're going to also craft items, destroy buildings, and wood. They're going to be led by a leader that's going to be changing if they ever go into turmoil because they can't complete the entirety of their decrees. You can also play as the Woodland Alliance, who represent the bunnies, the foxes, and the mice of the forest, who are opposing everything and rising up. They're going to be able to get outrage. They're going to build hideouts and strongholds out on the board and enact conspiracies that will gain them victory points. And primarily, they're going to gain their victory points through crafting items and conspiracies, but they also can engage in battle and win victory points that way as well. The final faction in this copy here is the Vagabond, who represents a single character tra la -la through the forest, causing issues for the other players, but also sometimes creating alliances, hostility, stealing, aiding, and gaining his victory points by completing those tasks and also crafting items as well. The cards in the game serve multifunction in that they will both be assigned to a particular region, or rather area, for foxes, bunnies, rabbits, with birds being wild. They also will contain items that can be crafted uh, by players in the game, and they will contain the conspiracies for the alliance. In addition, there is another type of a card that if players wish to drop out of the race to 40, they can take on a, a, a different victory condition. The game will continue round and round like this with players building buildings, expanding their influence until either a player gets 40 points or until a player does their alternate victory. So that's a look at Root. Now, I really did enjoy this game. What you did see on the table was a print and play prototype that I did put together myself, and as such, it's not exactly what you're gonna get if you back it. At the core, this game is an asymmetrical dudes on a map game that does remind me a little of Vast and the asymmetry, but I honestly, I like this game a lot better than I liked Vast. Vast was okay, but it didn't draw me back. This game, I could see myself wanting to play multiple Multiple times. Each faction is similar in their goals, but they play a little different. Now that's most apparent in the Vagabond, who really does feel like the wild card in the game, and I think I enjoyed him the most, followed by the Maquis de Cat. I wasn't able to go over all the rules for the game, because honestly, there's a lot in this game, but it, I hope this has given you at least an idea of how the game works, and whether or not it might be something you want to take a look at. I know it's definitely a project that I'm going to keep following, and I look forward to seeing you folks next time. That's it for another crowd surfing. Thanks again to all the guys for the work they do. Can't wait to see you guys in two weeks. Lots of great things. You see a great Kickstarter project I didn't mention, and I should have mentioned in the comments. Always promote these. It's good to spread the word and tell people about these great games. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowd Surfing on the Dice Tower.